Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza. This is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And today we bring you the story of a player who at one time was arguably the best player in the whole world, but for political reasons was never allowed to play in the NBA, at least not during his prime. That player is Arvidas Sabonis. If you are a fan of today's NBA like I am, then you might be familiar with his son, DeMontis Sabonis, who is a two-time All-Star for the Indiana Pacers. But this story is not about DeMontis. This story is about his dad, Arvidas. Arvidas was somewhat of a mystery for most of his playing career because he played behind the Iron Curtain. So let me take a moment to give you some of the historical context. From the late 1940s until end of 1991, the United States and the Soviet Union were bitter enemies. If the United States had a certain kind of military weapon, then the Soviet Union had to develop their own version of the same weapon. If the United States had 500 nuclear missiles, then the Soviet Union had to have 501. It was a back and forth kind of situation. The United States had spies working undercover within the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had spies working undercover within the United States. The two nations were polar opposites politically. The United States had developed a Western alliance that included most of the Western European countries, along with North and South America, Australia, New Zealand, and a few other countries. The Soviet Union had developed their own alliance that included Eastern European countries, along with Cuba, North Korea, and a few others. It was in this context that Arvita Sabonis grew up. He was born on December 19, 1964 in Kaunas, Lithuania. Although at the time, Lithuania was not its own country like today. Lithuania was just a region of the Soviet Union at the time. By 1977, at the age of 13, he began to play basketball in a local youth league. But in just two years, his height and skill were abundantly obvious. By the age of 15, the government placed him on the Soviet Junior National Team, where he continued to develop his skill and add to his height. By the age of 17, he was placed on the Senior National Team. He was also signed to play for Zalgiris, the professional team located in his hometown and played in the top level of the Soviet League. He had reached his full height of 7 foot 3 or 221 centimeters and was taking the league by storm. He was not allowed to play professionally outside of the Soviet Union because of the geopolitical relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States. His government only allowed him to play within the Soviet Union. The only time he was ever allowed to even leave the country was to play basketball for the national team, and that was only with heavy security surrounding the team. The Soviets were always afraid of their top athletes escaping while outside of their own borders. And he had a flair and a vision that was not typical of an Eastern European player. As a product of Eastern European culture, it was expected that players run exactly what the coach told them to run. Basketball in the Soviet Union was not a place for creativity and improvisation. Players ran the play as designed and played defense as instructed. But Arvidas was something different. He liked to put a little bit of hot sauce on his passes. He loved the no-look pass. He also had legitimate three-point range. Some have called him the 7'3 Larry Bird. And after watching some of his highlights from his prime playing for Zalgiris, I cannot disagree. He had all of the skills and instincts of Larry Bird, except that Arvita Sabonis was six inches taller. Therefore, he was also an amazing shot blocker. Anyone who tried to go to the cup against Arvidas was probably going to have his shot put back in his face. He had virtually no weaknesses. He could play all five positions. At 7'3", it was not uncommon for Arvidas to lead the fast break. 
He could dribble the ball down court and then throw a behind the back pass to a teammate running the wing. He was absolutely amazing. Many of you might remember Detlef Schrempp, who was one of the very first Europeans to play in the NBA. Detlef played for the German national team and had played against Arvidas many times in various European competitions. According to Detlef, if Arvidas had come to the NBA in his prime, not only would he have been the best center in the league, he might have been the best overall player in the NBA. And most Americans rejected that opinion at the time because the idea of the best player in the world being somebody who was not an American just did not compute. Of course, today, nobody cares. The last three MVP awards have been given to non-Americans, two for Giannis Antetokounmpo and one for Nikola Jokic. But if you go to YouTube and look up Arvidas highlights from his days in the Soviet Union, it is hard to disagree with Detlef's opinion. The guy was magical on the court. But he began to suffer leg injuries to his knees, ankles, and Achilles tendons that American doctors said he suffered from overuse. Arvidas himself has expressed that same opinion. He suffered injuries that required a certain amount of healing time. But the Soviet system did not put up with that. He was often ordered to play before he was fully healed. I once watched a documentary on the Soviet hockey team from the 1980s and most of those players said the same thing. The government always rushed players back into service before they were truly ready. Winning was always more important than the long-term health of the player. In 1986, he suffered his first serious Achilles injury, but Soviet doctors did not have the knowledge or skill to adequately treat the injury. Now, the Soviets would never admit this, but what Arvidas needed was American doctors. If he was ever going to play again, then he needed to go to America to be treated. Therefore, in 1986, the Soviet government allowed Arvidas to enter his name into the NBA draft in the hopes that he would get drafted and that the NBA or the team would pay for all necessary surgeries. He was drafted with the last pick in the first round by the Portland Trailblazers. Portland flew Arvidas to the United States to have his surgery, just as they had hoped, but the Soviet government did not allow Arvidas to actually sign a contract with the Trailblazers. So with that, Arvidas had to go back to the Soviet Union and continue his career with Zalgiris. Now this is a good place to take a break, and I'll be right back with the rest of his professional career. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome back to the show, and let us continue with the story of Arvidas Sabonis. As I mentioned, he had been drafted by the Portland Trailblazers, and the Trailblazers played for his surgery in order to help him heal from his Achilles injuries. But he was not allowed to actually join the NBA, at least not yet. So, he returned to the Soviet Union to continue his career. And he suffered another Achilles injury prior to the 1988 Olympics, but the Soviets rushed him back as usual. Even though Arvidas led the team to the gold medal, the long-term consequences is that he would never be the same again. The Portland Trailblazers heavily criticized the move by the Soviets since they still had the rights to sign Arvidas should he ever come to the NBA. The following year came the fall of the Berlin Wall, and that was in late 1989. The Soviet Union began to allow their top athletes to leave and sign contracts in Western countries. With that, Arvidas left Zalgiris and signed a three-year contract with Forum Valladolid of the Spanish League. That three-year contract expired in the spring of 1992, the summer of the Barcelona Olympics, the same one that featured the American Dream Team. With the Soviet Union only recently being dissolved, most of the Russian athletes were allowed to compete in 1992 under a temporary moniker of the Unified Team, bringing together athletes from most of the former Soviet republics. But Lithuania, where Arvidas was from, had declared independence and felt that they could qualify for the Olympics under their own flag with a completely Lithuanian roster. They chose to compete separately from their former Soviet teammates. Besides, Lithuania knew that most of the former Soviet talent was on their own roster anyway. They had Arvidas Sabonis and Sarunas Marshalonis, who had already begun playing for the Golden State Warriors. They were able to win the bronze medal at the Barcelona Games, proving that tiny Lithuania had great basketball talent. And I plan on doing an entire episode just on that 1992 Lithuanian basketball team. It is a great story. But anyway, back to Arvidas. When the contract with Valladolid ended, he signed for three years with Real Madrid, or Real Madrid. You might know the name Real Madrid as the famous soccer team from Spain, but they also have a basketball team as part of the same organization. That is the same team that Luka Doncic played for before coming to the NBA. 
Once Arvidas' contract with Real Madrid expired, he felt that he was ready to finally join the NBA. But he was 30 years old, and his best days were already behind him. The Portland Trailblazers still had his draft rights, so the only team that Arvidas could sign with was the Trailblazers. He came in as a 30-year-old rookie, a full decade older than the other rookies in his class. And if I can just take a moment to rant here a little bit, I think it is laughable that a guy with 15 years of professional experience in Europe comes to the NBA and is considered a rookie. There was nothing rookie about him. I think they should make a distinction between players who are in their first year of professional basketball and players with previous professional experience. The former should definitely be called rookies, but the latter should be called newcomers or something like that. That is so that the fans know the player has previous professional experience. For example, back in 2019, Luka Doncic would have won the Newcomer of the Year award since he had prior professional experience, and Trey Young could have still won the Rookie of the Year since it was truly his first year as a professional. Anyway, Arvidas came into the NBA and averaged 15 points, 8 rebounds, and 2 assists per game. Not spectacular numbers, but some of that flair was still there when he made a pass. He had a vision that most players were jealous of. It was like he had eyes on the back of his head. He always knew where his teammates were on the court. He even gave Shaq lots of problems. Because Arvidas had legitimate three-point range, his strategy to get by Shaq was to get the ball near the top of the key, and Shaq had a decision to make. He could sag back into the lane and just let Arvidas drain three-pointer after three-pointer, or he could try to close the space and guard Arvidas on the perimeter. When Shaq did go to the perimeter, Arvidas would just put the ball on the floor and blow right by him. Arvidas would then drive in and easily dunk the ball, or if the help defense decided to slide over to stop Arvidas, then Arvidas would just dump the ball off to a cutting teammate for an easy layup or dunk. He was just as deadly with the ball in the post with his back to the basket. At 7'3", even other NBA centers had trouble guarding him. Arvidas could not jump as high as he used to, but his hook shot was deadly accurate. He could just arc the ball over the hand of any defender. It was not exactly the sky hook like Kareem, but it was very similar. Thankfully for Arvidas, his game did not rely on supreme athleticism. His game was honed on superior technique and footwork. So even though he was not the player he used to be in his prime in the Soviet Union, he was still incredibly effective well into his mid and late 30s. After six seasons in the NBA, he decided to go back to Lithuania and play the 2002 season with his original team, Zalgiris. Now, this part is a little bit weird. After that one year with Zalgiris, he returns to Portland to play one more year with the Trailblazers again. And then he went back to Zalgiris for one more year with that team. And then he retired completely from playing professional basketball. And while he does not have many awards for his seven seasons in the NBA, he does have a bunch of MVPs and scoring titles from his 17 seasons of playing in Europe. Unfortunately, finding his statistics from his time playing in the Soviet Union was nearly impossible. It seems that unless someone has a bunch of paper box scores buried in a closet somewhere, it will be nearly impossible to compile his statistics from his prime. We can only go by how other players describe him. He was a legitimate 7'3 player who could play all 5 positions with incredible efficiency. But as far as that comparison to Larry Bird is concerned, it makes total sense. According to his son DeMontis, Arvidas' favorite player of all time is Larry Bird. While the two players never shared the court in the NBA, after all, Arvidas did not join the NBA until three years after Bird retired, they did share the court at the Olympics. In the Olympic semifinals in 1992, Larry Bird scored 10 points to Arvidas' scoring 11, but the score that really counts is the overall team score, and the United States defeated Lithuania by a score of 127 to 76. But it was a game that Arvidas would never forget, he got to play a game against his hero. Today, he is the president of the Lithuanian national team. In addition to his son Demontis, who plays with the Indiana Pacers, Arvidas has two other sons who play professionally in Europe. Arvidas was inducted into the Hall of Fame as a player in 2011. All I can say is that it would have been very nice to have seen him in the NBA in his prime. Well, that's it for today's episode. I hope I have been able to paint a picture of just how good he was. It is a shame that more video of him in his prime is not available, but for your convenience I will include a couple of links of his YouTube highlights of Arvidas of his days back in Europe. Join us next time when we share the story of the shot heard round the world. It happened during the 1976 NBA Finals between the Boston Celtics and the Phoenix Suns. 
That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts and check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.